Welcome to a short video overview of the Resuscitation Council's 2015 guidelines. I'm Dr Carl Gwinnett, the lead author of the In-Hospital Resuscitation Guidelines. The 2015 guidelines do not have any major or core changes to the guidelines that you have been using for the past five years. Instead, the new guidelines have a change in emphasis that is aimed at improving quality, which we hope will in turn will improve patient outcomes. There are three areas I'd like to draw your attention to as examples of such changes, and these are when performing chest compressions, minimising the pre-shock pause, and the use of waveform capnography. We'll start with chest compressions. High quality chest compressions are essential to improve outcomes. Resuscitation team members and team leaders should ensure chest compressions are performed to a depth of between 5 and 6 centimetres in the average adult and at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute and also ensure that the chest recoils completely after each compression. Regular changes of the individuals delivering chest compressions are also required to prevent fatigue. It is essential to minimise interruptions. Any break in the delivery of chest compressions reduces the chances of successful outcome. This is best achieved with prior planning and task allocation amongst team members before attending an arrest. Minimising the pre-shock pause. The delay between stopping chest compressions and delivery of the shock must be kept to an absolute minimum. Even 5 to 10 seconds delay will reduce the chances of the shock being successful. It is possible to reduce the pre-shock pause to less than 5 seconds by having an efficient team coordinated by a team leader who communicates effectively. All team members, apart from the person delivering chest compressions, should stand clear of the patient whilst the defibrillator is charged. The final safety check and warning to the person delivering compressions to stand clear immediately before defibrillation should be undertaken rapidly but efficiently. Once the shock has been delivered, chest compressions must resume immediately. There is no indication at this point to make any assessment of the patient. You should aim to achieve the entire process of manual defibrillation with less than a five second interruption to the chest compressions. Finally, the use of waveform capnography. Waveform capnography has a number of useful roles during CPR. It ensures the tracheal tube is in the airway rather than the esophagus. But remember, it does not distinguish between tracheal and bronchial placement. It gives an indication of the rate of ventilation thereby helping you to avoid hyperventilation, something which we know contributes to poor outcomes. It can also be used as an indicator of the quality of chest compressions, providing ventilation is kept constant. If end tidal CO2 values are consistently low, check the hand position of the person delivering compressions and ensure there is full release between compressions. A sudden sustained increase in end tidal CO2 during CPR may be the first indication of return of a spontaneous circulation. This may help prevent giving an unnecessary and potentially harmful dose of adrenaline in a patient with return of circulation that has not otherwise been identified. Finally, although much has been written about using end tidal CO2 values to indicate prognosis, we cannot currently recommend a specific value at any time during CPR that should be used on its own to stop resuscitation. In summary, the things the team members and team leader have to think about when attempting resuscitation are maintaining delivery of high quality chest compression with minimal interruptions, good teamwork and team leadership to minimise the pre-shock pause, and the increased use of waveform capnography. The Full Resuscitation Council 2015 guidelines can be found on our website along with other video summaries of all the other sections.